it, it's a little late to call it brunch, even using the rubric of the West Coast. So I guess now it's time for lunch with Bernie. Uh, Senator Sanders, I understand you've been hanging out with the president at the last hour. Well, maybe we'll call it early eve, to early dinner. <laughs> okay. Or, you know, like that. Had a huge crowd at the University of Vermont, and mm-hmm. he gave a good speech, and it was I spoke there as well, and it was a uh, it was a good day. Yeah, fine time was had by all. I, I read the news reports; it looked good. So, what's on your on your plate in the Senate? Well, uh, we just adjourned yesterday for the Easter break for two weeks. So, there's a lot that's hanging out there, but there's a lot also that's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the distressing things, and I think it talks about the dysfunctionality of what's going on in the House of Representatives with our right wing Republican leadership is rather amazingly, for once, uh, the Senate passed a good bill in a fairly strong bipartisan way. With 74 votes, uh, the Senate passed a transportation bill of $109 billion uh, so that we can start rebuilding our roads, our bridges, our transit system, uh, and to put people to work. When you invest in infrastructure, especially a, a crumbling infrastructure like ours, uh, you put a hell of a lot of people to work. So mm-hmm. in the Senate, at least, people were feeling fairly good, that we finally had done something, uh, and it was a reasonably good bill. Yeah. And then amazingly enough, although I suppose I, I should not be all that surprised, it gets to the House, and these guys just, you know, I, I, I just don't uh, have a clue. And here you have an opportunity to rebuild America. Our roads are in terrible shape, bridges in terrible shape, mass transit needs help, put people to work in the midst of this horrendous recession, and they can't get their act together. Because you have people there who simply do not believe investing in America. Right. They don't believe in rebuilding our roads. You're describing the Tea Party clock. I am describing the Tea Party people. So the best they could come up with was a three-month extension. But the bad news is that, you know, when you have companies out there who want the contracts to start building, uh, they and, and the building season is upon us. It's not going to do us any good to get contracts in January and February. So this this decision to delay uh, and not pass the Senate bill will probably cost us about 100,000 jobs. And uh, so that's just one example that the right-wing Republicans can't even get their act together when you're talking about something as simple and Mm -hmm. non-controversial as something we have done for decades, and that is invest in our roads and highways and transportation. So that's that's one issue there. Uh, we had a vote on uh, the Postal Service, and I know a lot of the listeners are, are quite concerned about uh, the proposal brought forth by Postmaster General, which uh, would have originally, his original proposal, uh, shut down 3,700 rural post offices. Uh, half of the mail processing plants in this country ended, Saturday mail delivery and so forth. Uh, I worked very hard on what is called a manager's amendment, uh, improving the original bill brought forth by Senators uh, Lieberman and uh, and Copper. Uh, we only got 52 votes. We needed 60, uh, but we got five Republican votes, and I believe that when the bill is brought up again, uh, we will we stand a good chance to get 60. It was defeated uh, mostly in terms of a process vote. The uh, minority leader uh, wanted to stay on the oil issue, and, uh, and and many of his members, I think, voted no for that reason, not not in opposition to the concepts uh, that we are fighting for. So that will come up after the break in, in perhaps three weeks, and I would hope that everybody uh, would call their senators, members of Congress, and talk about the need to save our postal service, and there are ways that we can uh, do that and, and protect the jobs that otherwise would be lost. So that that's an issue uh, we have been working hard on. Uh, I know that anybody who is uh, in their car right now is upset about the uh, high price of oil. Uh, we're working on it in a number of ways to try to address that issue. Uh, I believe, and I think an increasing number of Americans believe, that at a time when supply is higher than it was three years ago, when gas was a buck ninety-four a gallon, and demand is lower than any time since 1997, and Internationally, we're seeing uh, twice as much supply being developed uh, as demand being uh, brought forth. That the issue is not supply and demand. The issue has everything to do with excessive speculation on the part of Wall Street companies. Uh, the same companies, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and, and these guys, they 
forced us into this terrible recession are back again. They're speculating very heavily on the oil futures market. Goldman Sachs itself, and, and Goldman Sachs may be the largest speculator, uh, estimated a couple of weeks ago in a study that excessive speculation might add 56 cents to a gallon of gas. There are uh, other people think the number might be higher than that. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's an issue of uh, I know, huge consequence, not only to individuals, but it has a lot to do with the nature of the recovery. Uh, when you have oil and gas this high, uh, it really does slow down the recovery. So we're going to work on that. We're going to try to demand. We have legislation in to force the Commodities Future Trading uh, Commission whose job it is is to regulate this type of stuff, to do what they are supposed to do, and that is to end excessive speculation. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue uh, we are working very hard on. I think uh, anyone who reads the papers uh, sees that the health care reform bill has gone before uh, our friends at the uh, United States Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, I think within the progressive community, there is a lot of concern that uh, the Supreme Court, which has... Uh, years ago in 2000, refused Florida's right to count their votes and elected Bush and the Supreme Court that two years ago gave us this disastrous Citizens United decision, which is causing so much, so many problems uh, in terms of allowing corporations and, and wealthy individuals to spend as much money as they want on the political process without disclosure. Uh, these are the same guys who are now considering health care reform. So I have no idea. There's a lot of speculation. Uh, it looks like you have three of the right-wing members of the court who will definitely vote against health care reform. You probably have four uh, members of the court who will vote uh, to sustain health care reform. And I think it comes down to, uh, they think, uh, two people, maybe uh, Roberts and Kennedy, who are somewhere in the middle on this issue. So who knows how it will turn out. But this is what I will say. If these guys vote against health care reform, uh, what they really will be telling the world is that in the midst of these enormously difficult times, not just in health care, but in the economy, in global warming, that they believe uh, that the United States Congress and the American people literally cannot respond to these crises. That it's unconstitutional to go forward uh, and try to address some of the most important problems facing not only our country but the planet. And this reminds me very much, and I know, Tom, you have written a lot of history. We're right back to the 1930s, mm-hmm. uh, where you had a Supreme Court uh, undermining FDR's effort to address the Depression. And this smacks to me of, of something similar. So, um, and I say this, by the way, and, and repeat what I've said many, many times on the show. I voted for the health care reform bill. I think it does some important things. I was especially active in in. Uh, getting funding to double the number of community health centers in America. So we'll go from 20 million to 40 million people who receive that help uh, and access to those uh, community health centers. But at the end of the day, what I believe, and, and maybe if the Supreme Court overturns this, I don't know, maybe we'll we'll have to go in that direction, which I certainly will be very active in, and that is we need to move forward and end the international disgrace of America being the only country in the industrialized world that doesn't guarantee health care to every man, woman, and child as a right of citizenship. And the system that we have right now is quite dysfunctional. you got 45,000 people dying this year because they don't get to a doctor, and we end up spending, with 50 million uninsured, almost twice as much for person on health care as any other nation. So, uh, you know, this is an issue that I'm not going to give up on, and the American people are not going to give up on. Amen. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour, our national town hall meeting. We'll be back with your questions for Senator Sanders right after this. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And be sure to check out Bernie's website. You can sign his petition to roll back Citizens United. You can sign up for his free newsletter, the Bernie Buzz. You can read all the news there at sanders.senate.gov. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you and Senator Bernie Sanders on the line. Joan in Ludington, Michigan, watching us on Free Speech TV. Joan, thank you for watching, and uh, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, I'd like to ask if Senator Sanders uh, would be, what does he think of the idea of having um, uh, a value-added tax like they have in Germany? 
I, I guess I don't understand how that would work within the country, but it, it, it seems to me it would be a real advantage to have it for trade. <laughs> well, Joe, uh, I believe uh, clearly uh, our current tax system uh, makes no sense at all right now. Uh, we are losing about $100 billion every single year uh, because large corporations and, and wealthy people uh, have their money in tax havens in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda. You have, uh, we just voted on this issue the other day, you have, among others, oil companies who have made billions of dollars in profit uh, in some years paying uh, nothing at all in federal income tax. You have 25% of large corporations in America paying nothing in, in federal income tax. Uh, you have the wealthiest people in this country right now uh, who are doing phenomenally well. I should mention, Tom, I don't know if you saw uh, an op-ed in the New York Times recently pointing out that a recent study showed that between 2009 and 2010, the latest information, 93% of all new income went to the top 1%. Yep, and today the front page of the Financial Times had an article about a guy who last year made $3.9 billion, with a B, on a Wall Street, a Wall Street guy. Right. So you've got all of that absurdity of people of people on top doing phenomenally well. They are effective tax rates, the lowest in decades, and, and that's one of the reasons why we have this uh, terrible deficit situation. So what I would say to Joe is I'm not a great fan of a value-added tax. What I believe in is a progressive and fair income tax. The more money you make, uh, the higher percentage of your income uh, should be taxed. And, and uh, what clearly... I would hope that almost everybody understands that it is totally insane to maintain uh, the Bush tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country. That's something that should have been repealed years ago uh, and must be repealed. So to answer uh, Joe's question, I'm a believer in a uh, in a progressive income tax and fair corporate taxes as well. Okay. Anna in Santa Clara, California, watching on Free Speech TV. We just have a minute to the break. Anna, quick question for Bernie. Yeah, I'd like to ask Bernie where I could send a small check to for his re-election. Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't know if you, if we can talk about that, Bernie. Uh, well, let me just say that I think we, we're not going to be talking about that on this show. But thank you very much, and we have a, a website, which a campaign website, which deals with that. Yeah, so, and, and you, you can track it down. You can Google Bernie. Thank whatever. you very much, Bernie. Uh, in the in the twenty thirty seconds before the break, uh, further thoughts on on the possibility of changing our tax code? Could it happen? Well, not with what I mean. Yeah, it could happen, and everybody in the world talks about tax reform. Mm. Uh, but uh, what many of my right wing friends uh, in um, including the chairman of the uh, House Budget Committee, Paul Ryan, talks about really are lowering taxes for the wealthiest people in this country and not addressing the incredible loopholes that exist within corporate tax law. Yeah, Paul Ryan wants to preserve the, the oil tax uh, giveaway and $3 trillion in tax breaks to billionaires. It's amazing. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our brunch with Bernie, maybe lunch today. Dinner, early dinner with Bernie on the Tom Hartman program. We'll be right back with Senator Sanders. Hey, friends, it's Tom Hartman. This portion of the Tom Hartman program is brought to you in part by Blinds.com. Blinds, shades, shutters, drapes. More information online, Blinds.com. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Welcome back to the place where despair is not an option, a phrase that I think I borrowed from Senator Bernie Sanders, who's on the line with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour and taking your calls. Kirk in Longwood, Florida. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders. Hello. Yes, um, I want to address a couple of issues. First of all, I live with HIV and AIDS, and because of the late Senator Kennedy, he put the Ryan White Act through 
I, you probably know what that act is. Yep. It, it provides for services, medications. That it actually pays for my health insurance, which I have Aetna, which is $740 a month with a $5,000 um, deductible and another $1,500 in co-insurance. Uh, back in 2010, it was a $2,500 I It was $2,500 um Deductible. Deductible. And in 2010 or 2011, they raised it from 750 to 1150 And, of course, Ryan White would only pay for 750, 740 of it or 750 So I had to go to a $5,000 deductible, which, of course, my doctor visits, my meds are paid. But I have avascular necrosis in my hip. My hip is dead because I'm, my liver's failing because back when I was a kid, I had hepatitis B. And because of the drugs and because of the HIV, all the I went to Shan's Teaching Hospital. I don't know if you're aware of that. Kirk, Kirk I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there's a whole bunch of people who have questions for Bernie. Is there a specific question for Bernie buried in here? Well, I just want to know. With I mean, as far as the you know, this healthcare is going. I mean, I have insurance, but I don't have insurance. No, that's right. I can right. get blood Kirk, tests. I can go to the doctor, it. but right, you I, got I, it, Kirk. I need Thank a new hip. I mean, Thank you. Because what Kirk is talking about is a situation that exists in millions of homes in America. And actually, we got that same call, I think, last week, Tom. Yes. And, and he is the story. Kirk Not the same guy, I, but the same kind of story. Yeah. Not the same guy, but the, no, the similar right, problem. But the, same, the essence, the same message. Yeah. And that is, I have insurance, but I don't have insurance. So what does he mean by that? It means, yes, he has, in a sense, catastrophic insurance. Yes, in some cases, the insurance company will pay. But with such a large deductible... Uh, in his case, and in millions of other people's cases, it doesn't matter what kind of insurance you have because you don't have enough money to pay the doctor in the first place. Right. You don't have enough money. I was talking to a physician uh, a couple of years ago here in, in Vermont, a primary care physician. She said that about 25 or 30 percent of the uh, prescriptions that she writes for her patients are never filled because <laughs> people can't afford to fill them. Oh, my. So, and that's true all over the country. I think that's roughly what the, what the situation is. So you have this absurd situation that even when people do have insurance, it doesn't mean anything if you can't afford to go to the doctor and pay the upfront money that you have to pay. So what's the answer? The answer is that we need to do two things. Number one, as a nation, do what every other major country on earth is doing and say that health care is a right. You know, if Kirk has a kid who's 10 years old, that kid will go to school as a right of being somebody in Florida, somebody in America. Kids go to school regardless of the income of their family. And all over the world, countries have also said what I think is uh, the humane and, and, and intelligent thing to do, that you have the right to health care because you're an American. And uh, we have not done that. And that's why 50 million Americans today have no health insurance, and many more are precisely in Kirk's situation with insurance, but with high, unaffordable deductibles. So what's the answer? The answer is also to recognize that we end up, as I mentioned a moment ago, spending almost twice as much per capita on health care. Why is that? Because billions and billions and billions of dollars are sucked out of the system, not providing health care, but for insurance company uh, profiteering, for advertising, for administrative cost, all of the billing that goes on in this country. You have uh, hospitals with dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are not providing health care. All they're doing is billing you. And you've got drug companies who are charging Americans the highest costs in the world for prescription drugs. You add all that together, it is a system which is not working for the average work American, which is why I strongly believe we've got to move toward a Medicare for All single-payer system. And uh, I was just with the governor of Vermont today, and he reiterates and is fighting for a single-payer system for Vermont and if Vermont can do it, I hope the rest of the country will follow us. Scott in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders, on behalf of all the letter carriers in Wisconsin, I want to appreciate that, let you know what we appreciate all you're doing to help the Postal Service survive. It's a great institution that America really needs. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I know Sen Senator Cole is certainly on board with you. Yep. Uh, but what can we do as individuals to make sure that your uh, agenda uh, happens after the Easter recess? Well, you can please have your brothers and sisters in Wisconsin and throughout this country just get on the phone uh, and talk to your members of Congress, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to your United States uh, senators, and tell them 
that as you've just indicated, uh, the Postal Service is of extraordinary importance to America, to our economy. There are something like 8 million jobs associated with the Postal Service, including all of the businesses who rely every single day on mail, on newspapers, on magazines, on printing, on packages. They need to get packages delivered properly. And also to make the point that, yes, the Postal Service has got to change. Email is real. First-class mail has gone down. Everybody recognizes that. But what is not real, what is not fair, is for the Postal Service to have to pay $5.5 billion every single year into future employee health care benefits. There's $44 billion in that account right now. They should not have to pay any more of that. And that is the lion's share of the debt uh, of, the, of the financial problems of the Postal Service today. Furthermore, we do have to change the business model of the post office, make it much more entrepreneurial, bring in more revenue. But thank you very much, Scott, for your work in the post office, and let's work together to save it. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour, taking your calls in our national town hall meeting here on the Tom Hartman program. We'll be right back with more of your calls for Senator Sanders. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. And check out Bernie's website over at sanders.senate.gov. You can sign his amendment to re- to repeal Citizens United, among other things. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. Anytime, anytime they want me. Anytime, anytime they need me. Anytime, Welcome back to the place where smart people get their news. The Tom Hartman Program. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. Brunch with Bernie. Taking your calls in our national town hall meeting. Jackie in Hopewell Junction, New York. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello. Uh, I'm a provider of mental health services for children in my community for uh, about 20 years. And I don't hear often about um, when they're talking about health care reform, about the difficulties that uh, we providers have with billing. My clients can have insurance, but for me to get paid is another story, and it's very, uh, very difficult. Lots of times I get rejected, and I have to bill over and over again, and the cost for billing becomes very high. Well, Jackie, uh, that is a huge issue, uh, and one of the reasons that the cost of health care is so high in America is that approximately uh, 30% of every health care dollar goes to administrative purposes, and that is uh, just the whole billing process. Uh, when you spend time filling out forms for insurance companies, that's a cost of the health care system. When people in the insurance companies reject you and reject you again, that's a cost of the health care system because somebody's paying their salaries. Um, and the advantages of a universal health care system where people get the health care that they need is that to a significant degree you do away with billing. A couple of months ago, I had a bunch of kids from the United Kingdom walking in, uh, they, in in my office in Washington. They don't even have cards. They just walk into the door. They walk into the their provider. Uh, they're checked off, and they go get their care. And that's it. There is no exchange of, of billing and, and, and all of that cost, which is one of the reasons why health care in the U.K. is so much less than in America. Uh, and then the second issue, of course, is that insurance companies uh, do their best uh, to make sure that people get as less care as possible because it costs them more money if they cover the care that providers provide. So often they're going to reject uh, what providers do, and providers have to go back and back and back, uh, and it's a costly process. Uh, so uh, that is another reason why uh, we've got to move toward a universal health care system to get rid of all of that stupid waste in, ad- in administrative costs. When we spend a dollar on health care, that money should go to providers, it should go to prescription drugs, it should go to disease prevention, it should not go to billing and advertising and just all of the waste that's currently part of uh, our system. Jim in Denver, Colorado, listening on AM 760. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, Jim. Um, my, my wife uh, is from Grand Island, Nebraska. She told me her mother uh, wrote and told her that the post office had a new building built uh, for sorting the mail there in Grand Island, a new building. 
and now they're they're not going to uh, fill that building. They're going to have the sorting of the mail all done in Omaha, Nebraska, and then the mail sent back as, after it's sorted. So, I mean, deliveries are going to take two or three days extra. And I was just wondering if you knew about that. Well, Jim, I don't know about uh, the situation in Nebraska. Uh, what I do know is uh, if you shut down, as the Postmaster General originally wanted to do, I don't think he is in that position now, uh, shut down half of the processing plants in this country. Uh, as Jim indicates, it, it simply means it's going to take longer for people to get their uh, mail. That's just the simple fact of it. Um, what we are trying to do now uh, in this legislation is to limit the number of processing plants that could be shut down and also to maintain a strong delivery uh, mail delivery standard. So uh, what I would say, Jim, is the fight that you're fighting uh, in Nebraska is similar to the fight that we're fighting in Vermont to maintain our processing plant and speedy mail delivery. And that's going on all over the country, and that's exactly uh, what the legislation that we're working on is, is attempting to deal with. Alan in Muskegon, Michigan, watching us on Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Tom. Uh, I spoke to you a couple of weeks ago about the... Uh, the uh, Tremont Martin case, but uh, I want to talk about corporations and patriotism, particularly the idea that Republicans have been wrapping themselves in the flag for years about patriotism, and particularly with regard to health care, we have a situation where their loyalty is to their shareholders, certainly not to the benefit of the country with a constitution that starts with we the people of the United States. So I'd just like to have your comments about that and ask that the Democrats use patriotism to confront these Republicans. And, and Bernie, could I add to that, if I may? Um, I'm curious why the Democrats don't make this a national security issue, because if we get attacked with chemical or biological weapons and we have a national health care system, and, and, of course, that's why we went into Iraq, right, <laughs> because he supposedly had it. Uh, we would be in a much better position to defend ourselves. Right. I, I think, you know, Alan makes a pretty basic point, which is, is, is true. Um, I don't think anyone has the illusion anymore that the large multinational corporations uh, really care very much about the people of the United States of America. Uh it is the consumer and the worker in this country that made them the great and powerful corporations they are now. And what they have done in recent years, last 10, 20, 30 years, is in many cases, almost all cases of these large multinationals, have shut down plants in America, moved to China and other low-wage countries. Uh, one of the astounding facts of our time, and one of the reasons why the middle class in America is collapsing and poverty is increasing, is that in the last 10 years, we have lost, Tom, 60,000 factories in America. 60,000 factories, not all of them from trade, but many of them related to trade at a cost of millions of good-paying jobs. So to answer Alan's point, if these guys thought that they could make, you know, three cents more by running to China or to another low-wage country uh, while they throw Americans out on the street, they don't hesitate for a second because they really have no allegiance to the United States of America. Their allegiance is to the CEOs and the fancy uh, compensation packages that those people get and to their shareholders. But to the workers of this country, no allegiance uh, whatsoever. What I am happy to say, though, is I am detecting in recent years uh, a real Buy American resurgence. I think people all over the country worry about the future of America, when they go to the store and they can't buy a product made in America. Uh, it's made in China, it's made uh, in Mexico, it's made in, in all kinds of countries, but it's not made in America. And I think, as I've mentioned on this show, what we are trying to do is maybe start small. Uh, we've worked with the Smithsonian Museums, getting them to buy more American. We're working with the company that supplies our national monument gift shops, getting to buy more American. We're working with the Veterans Administration, met with General Shinseki, the secretary of the VA, uh, last month. They're beginning now in their gift shops in hospitals all over the country to buy more America. We're going to keep expanding that. But in, in terms of patriotism, 
I would say that corporate America has said that their patriotism lies toward their CEOs uh, and their stockholders, certainly not to the United States of America. Michael in Hinsdale, New Hampshire. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Michael? No, Michael. Ed in, whoop, Ed just vanished. Uh, Robert in San Francisco. Hey, Robert, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Good morning. Um, Senator Sanders, won't it be pretty easy for uh, you and the Democrats to run against the Republicans on the Paul Ryan budget plan? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're advocating for the rich, uh, more tax cuts for the rich, social programs, and um, they're still not going to balance the budget. No, I, I think, like, Robert, you're exactly right. Uh, I think, uh, I hope everybody knows that Paul Ryan of Wisconsin is the chairman of the uh, House Budget Committee, uh, the leading Republican on, on budget issues. Uh, last year he came up with a disastrous budget, and this year he came up with a very similar budget. And what Ryan is talking about is uh, maintaining and increasing uh, tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country, at a time when the wealthy are doing unbelievably well. I just mentioned a moment ago, the, least, the last statistics that I saw, 2010, 93% of all new income went to the wealthiest 1%. How much better can you do than that? Hmm. And yet the rich get much richer, and Ryan and other Republicans want to reduce their taxes, which are now at the lowest level than they've been in decades. Uh, and at the same time, uh, as Robert indicates, they are going after social programs big time. You have tax breaks to the rich, and the other half of what you do is to end Medicare as we know it. What Ryan wants to do is convert Medicare into what is called a voucher program, and that is you give people a check, maybe it's for $8,000, and you say, okay, you're 67, uh, you're dealing with cancer, you're dealing with heart disease, here's your check for $8,000. You can go out to any private insurance company you want. Well, Tom, you tell me, if you're 67 and you're struggling with cancer, how far an $8,000 check is going to take you? Yeah, nobody will even take it. Right. I mean, what kind of coverage are you going to get? How many days in the hospital are you going to get for $8,000? So what we have to do uh, is, is reject that Republican mentality of tax breaks for the rich, cuts in, in Medicare, in Medicaid, uh, cuts in education, cuts in virtually any and all programs that are of importance to working families in this country. What makes the Republicans different today than they used to be as they move to the extreme right is they don't just want to cut, they ultimately want to do undo every single piece of legislation passed in the last 80 years to protect ordinary Americans. Let's roll back the, the New Deal time. Exactly. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour here on the Tom Hartman Program. Back with more of your calls for Senator Sanders right after this. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And if you think Citizens United is insane, get over to Sanders.Senate.gov and sign Bernie's petition, or his uh, constitutional amendment, excuse me, to overturn it. Welcome back. Uh, Reginald in Houston, Texas. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Senator, the, 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 the situation that's happened with, in uh, Florida with Trayvon Martin and the Stand Your Ground law with that in place, uh, that, that law, I think, needs to be repealed. The NRA and the lobbyists have, have backed that wholeheartedly. And I'm in favor of the Brady Bill. If we had that in place like London and other countries, you know, with handguns, that wouldn't be the case with, uh, if we wouldn't be speaking about this. What do you think about that, that case as far as that guy come, going to, uh, coming to, you know, being charged, coming to do at least some, some things being, uh, uh, inquired about as far as arrest until they go to a jury? Well, let, let me just say around law as far as repealing it. For raising the issue. Uh, I don't want to get too deeply involved in that particular case, which is now under investigation. Uh, but I, you know, everybody knows that self-defense is a time-honored uh, position in this country. Somebody comes breaking into your house, do you have a right to defend yourself? Of course you do. But this stand your ground business opens up just the opportunity. Somebody walks by you and looks at you in a bad way. Somebody walks by and says something 
to you, uh, and and you and, and above and beyond that, I mean, it just opens up the floodgates uh, for people to be extremely, extremely aggressive, and that's certainly what it appears to in this Martin case in in Florida. Uh, get a, um, so the answer is, in, in my view, I, I think we got to take a hard look uh, at those laws, not only in Florida but uh, throughout this country. Uh, and thank you for watching Free Speech TV. Catherine, uh, watching Free Speech TV in Abilene, Texas. You're on the air, Senator Sanders. <coughs> Catherine? Yeah? You are on uh, the air. My question is, you always heard the middle class are the backbones of America. With so much piled on top of us, so much, you know, uh, yes? Yeah, uh, Catherine, you're, there's a delay with your TV. If you're hearing your TV, it'll disorient you. Just pay attention to your phone. Okay, let me... Take care of that, okay? Okay. So y- um, your, your question for Bernie. My question is, the middle cl- I always heard the middle class with the backbones of America, you know. We're the ones who's paying taxes. We're the ones who's trying to keep our heads above the water. Mm-hmm. You know, what happens when the stress becomes overbearing and the middle class start to disintegrate? Well, Catherine, thank you very much, you know, for that, that question. You know, Tom... What I think Catherine is referring to, and which we certainly do not talk about enough, uh, is the incredible stress that people are feeling right now, working families are feeling uh, every single day trying to keep their heads above water. If you have a job uh, in which your wages have gone down, if you have a job in which you're being forced to pay more for health care, if you're figuring out or if your dream was to be able to send your kid to college and you're not able to do that, uh, it just rips you apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was We did a hearing uh, last year uh, in which we had a number of doctors making the point that if you're in the lower percentile, lower 20% of income earners in America, you're going to die six years younger than if you were in the top 20 percent and one of those reasons one of the reasons for that it's not only lack of access to health care it's the stress mm. of economic struggle every single day how do you keep the electric lights on how do you put gas into the car you know what that wears you down yeah absolutely that breaks your spirit more more with your calls for senator sanders right after this I should like to have it said of my second administration that in it, these forces met their master. Welcome back. Tom Harmon here with you. It's our brunch with Bernie R. Michael in Hinsdale, Vermont. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Well, Senator Sanders and Mr. Harmon. Um, Excuse me, Hinsdale, uh, New Hampshire. Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm about... Two miles from the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant in Bradbury, in Vernon, Vermont, and I'd really like to see it shut down. Even though the NRC just gave it a twenty-year extension on their license to operate, I know what happens to metal. And I ran a chemical plant in New York for eight years, and I know what happens when you with repeated heating and cooling. And I'm really worried after 40 years of operating that reactor that they're saying we can't shut it down. I'd like to see us go in the direction of Germany and explore solar and wind. And I, uh, that's what I wish would happen. But what can I do to, well, here's what you could do. to help? I agree with you and have been somewhat active. And that is your position, by the way, is the position of the Vermont State Legislature. Uh, a couple of years ago by a vote of 26 to 4. That's a pretty strong bipartisan vote. Uh, the Vermont State Senate said uh, that uh, they choose not to extend the life of Vermont Yankee beyond the 40 years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as uh, Michael indicates, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did extend uh, the life, uh, and a judge ruled uh, against the state of Vermont that uh, decision is now under appeal uh, for a variety of reasons, which I will not get into now legally. I think the judge was wrong, and I, I'm glad the appeal is going forward. Uh, but the bottom line is, does 
do the people of Vermont and any other state in the country have the right to determine their own energy future? And I would say that most people in Vermont agree with Michael and that we see our future in terms of energy efficiency. We see our future in terms of a growth in solar, wind, geothermal, biomass. Uh, that's where we want to go. And uh, I will continue to work with the governor and the legislature uh, to see that uh, we shut that plant down. Forty years is enough. Rob in Streamwood, Illinois, listening on WCPT. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Good afternoon, Senator Sanders. It's a pleasure to finally talk to you. Um, I have a, a couple, just a couple of real quick questions. Number one, couldn't they have written this uh, Affordable uh, Health Care Act really in a simpler manner where they could have said, here, there is no mandate essentially, but if you buy it, you would get a tax break of, say, $2,000 on your IRS forms at the end of the year. Therefore, nobody's forcing you to buy it, but if you do, you get a couple thousand dollars back, it's much like writing off a house mortgage or your property taxes. If you choose to buy a house, you get a tax break. Um, that's one thing I think they could have done and avoided the Supreme Court thing altogether. Also, one more thing. If the court does overturn this, the Obamacare Act, if they overturn that, doesn't that open the door for the right-wing crazies to all of a sudden say, hey, Social Security is a mandate, Medicare is a mandate, they're forcing you to buy something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. against your will? The answer to the latter part of your question in terms of Social Security and Medicare is I suspect that's right. Uh, it is no great secret that you have an increasing number of right-wing Republicans who say, hey, it's not just that we want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Uh, we don't believe it's constitutional. So, and I think they're probably raising the same point as Rob is. Uh, in terms of simplicity, my goodness, the uh, health care reform bill is enormously complex, uh, far too complex. I'm not sure that the solution is the one that Rob offered. I think the issue with the individual mandate is, and the fear is, look, anybody in America can walk out of your house Today, you could have a heart attack, you can get hit by a bus. If you have no health insurance, somebody is going to have to pay for you. That's the simple reality. Uh, is that right? Is that appropriate? Should everybody contribute? And that's what the individual mandate is about. My own view is uh, a little a different twist on that. I believe that everybody should contribute, but that is through a progressive tax system. A, you cover everybody, not force everybody to have insurance. You cover everybody. And second of all, you raise the funds in a progressive tax way, which is what many other countries are doing. David in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I'm assuming that's Arkansas. It says AK, but that's got to be AR, right, David? That's right. Okay, you're on with Senator Sanders. Well, thank you. Uh, By the way, I did sign uh, the petition. Thank you. Uh, Yes, and I really enjoy it. I'm very happy to be able to talk to my favorite senator. Um. My suggestion, actually I have a couple of them, after having read T.R. Reed's book, uh, it seems to me that uh, what Switzerland did is a pretty good idea, where they uh, they mandated nonprofit insurance companies. And uh, my idea is to provide seed money for uh, potential nonprofit uh, health insurance companies uh, as long as we can't have the single payer. Of course, that would that would also probably require a menu, you know, for pr- standard procedures in healthcare, like they have in many other countries as well. I wonder what you think of that idea. Well, we had, uh, in case some of the listeners don't know, T.R. Reed is a writer. We had him up in Burlington a few years ago, uh, who has written about international uh, healthcare systems. He's gone all over the world uh, and and seen how different systems work. Uh, and his point, if my memory is correct, is that the United States is the only uh, country in the world where for-profit uh, health uh, insurance companies operate. In other countries, Switzerland and others, Germany, you have non-profit insurance companies. Uh, and he believes, and I agree with him, that is one of the reasons why uh, health care is so expensive in this country. Uh, you know, David, there are a number of different approaches. The Swiss have an approach, Germans have an approach, Canadians have an approach, the British have an approach, Scandinavia has an approach. Uh, I, I myself am sympathetic to uh, a single-payer approach because it's simple. I mean, basically what it says is 
uh, everybody is entitled to the same quality health care. It's going to be paid for uh, out of a progressive tax system. Uh, people can go to any doctor that they want. My preference is that these programs should be administered statewide because states have different needs, and, it's, and, the, and the people are closer to their legislature than they are to Washington. But that's kind of uh, my, my approach to uh, health care. Bernie, thanks so much for being with us today. Good to be with you, Tom. Thank you. Sanders.senate.gov. Check it out.